It was a horrific automobile accident. The police reports say the car probably rolled six to eight times. I blacked out for most of that. I, I, I don't recall actually rolling, but when the car came to a stop, I was incredibly conscious. I, I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what happened? And the first thing I was aware of was Spencer, my, my seven-year-old, crying in the back seat, just crying hysterically. And, and as a father, I thought, okay, well, he's okay. I've got to get to my son. I've got to get to my boy. But that's when I realized that I could not move. I, I was pinned and I, I couldn't tell if I was pinned to the seat or the floorboard. I was disoriented. I was struggling to breathe. There was excruciating pain. I, I had no idea of my injuries. What had actually happened is that, that both of my legs had been crushed and, and shattered. The, the left leg was actually amputated above the knee. My back had been injured. My rib cage was injured and my lungs were collapsing. My right arm had almost been torn off. It was severed really badly and all the muscles had been torn out of the socket. And then the seat belt cut through my midsection and had ruptured my intestines, my insides. I, I had no idea. All I knew is that my son was crying. I wanted to get to him. And that's when the brutal reality hit that no one else was crying. That's when I thought, oh my gosh. And I knew, I, I knew Tamara is gone. I saw, which I don't talk a lot about, uh, Tamara, because she had laid her seat back, was not restrained properly by the seat belt. And so she had suffered some pretty severe head trauma in the accident, which took her life. Griffin, my, my little boy, the car seat had broken up and he had been ejected from the car. And so I couldn't see him. But it's like I knew in my heart. I just, I, it was the darkest, uh, most awful feeling of they're gone. They're gone and I knew that. And I, suddenly the guilt, I mean the regret, I just kept thinking, can't, can't I just take back that five seconds? I mean, what happened? How did I crash the car? It was absolute panic. And Spencer is crying hysterically. In fact, I was attempting to speak to him. I, I knew I was losing consciousness, but I, I said to Spencer, I said, it's going to be okay. And I thought, that's a lie. It's not okay. I mean, half the family's gone. I'm losing consciousness. Nothing will ever be the same. But it was in that darkest moment, it was in that turmoil, that, that horror of the accident, that I felt well, the best word is light. It's like light came. It's like I felt light come and circle around me. Almost like it was a blanket. Almost like it was comforting me in this horrific moment. And it felt as if I was rising above the scene of the accident. The best word is maybe like in this bubble of light. And, and I rose above the accident. Oh, now I can breathe. Oh, I don't, the, the pain's gone. Am I okay? That's what I was asking is, am I okay? Suddenly I realized that Tamara, who I, I knew was gone at the scene, she was there with me and very much alive and, and gorgeous. I mean, that's you know the only reason I share what happened to her in the accident because all of a sudden she was there and there was no injuries, there was no head trauma. She was radiant and beautiful and glorious. She was upset and frantic. She's like, Jeff, Jeff, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. You can't come, you can't be here. There I was looking at the woman I, I loved more than life, but I also knew I had a little boy crying in the back seat of that car. And I had to make a choice about coming back. It was so real. I mean, it wasn't like a dream at all. Like, it's almost like my senses were, were multiplied. For instance, in, in this state, if I can see and smell and taste and hear and all those things, in that state, it was super sensory. It was so real that it makes this life feel like the foggy dream. It's like this feels like the weird, strange, dreamy state. That was reality. I looked at her and I thought, I've got to go back. I can't leave our little boy orphaned. I literally got to say goodbye and I made the choice to come back. Now, I didn't have to figure out how do I go back. It was, it was in the intention. It was in the intention of thinking, I'm going back. As I did so, I found myself wandering around a hospital. 
Now, I have no concept of time in this bubble of light. I, I mean, I, I don't know how many minutes or hours went by. I later found out that people arrived at the scene of the accident. One happened to be a doctor, which was able to do some emergency procedures, care for Spencer. They rushed us to a local hospital, and Spencer was not badly hurt, my seven-year-old. He was banged up a little bit, but he basically physically walked away from the accident. But emotionally, he thought the whole family was gone. With the extent of my injuries, there's no way that hospital could see to my care. They had to life flight me to a level one trauma center, which they did. They flew me to the nearest metropolitan city where I could get the care I, I needed. And I, I had no idea about any of that. All I knew is I had wrecked the car. I had said the most profound goodbye I would ever say. And there I was wandering around through a hospital, looking at the nurses and the doctors and the patients and the families of the patients. But the incredible thing is everybody I saw, I, I knew them. Like they, they were strangers, but I would, I, would, I would look at them and I knew everything about them. I knew their love, their hate, their joy, their decisions, their pain, their motivations. I, I knew them as if they were me was intense things. I, I felt there was a nurse and I just, I knew that she had been abused as a child, physically, sexually, emotionally. And I thought, well, I could feel it as if it had happened to me. But in feeling it, I had this profound compassion for her. It's like, oh, wow, look what she has overcome. Look what she endured. And then I had this intense feeling of, look who she is now because of that, this compassionate, you know, medical staff, literally healing people. I, I had this intense connection to everyone. And there was this sense of love for everyone. And it didn't matter who they were or what they had done or what they hadn't done. And I saw them as this incredible soul. All those judgments from religion just went away. It was like, aren't they incredible? Aren't they beautiful? And I, I did have a... Uh, a verse like from the Bible come up as I'm wandering around the hospital. That There's a famous verse um, attributed to Jesus that says, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Which I used to think was a really nice passage about being nice to people, which I suppose it is, but I was feeling it at such an intense level. I, I realized, wow, so what Jesus was saying is, I am them, and they are me, and that's what I was experiencing. I was them, and they were me, and there was this oneness, this connection that was undeniable. And I, and I was the heroin addict. I, I was the nurse. I was all of it. I was everything, and everything was me. But it was all encircled to this intense love and this intense compassion, unconditional love. And I was, I was just marveling at this experience until I came up to a, a man or a body laying on the gurney that I, I didn't feel anything from, which I thought was weird. And so I stepped closer and took a look, and that's when I realized, oh my goodness, that's, that's me. But it, but it wasn't me. I was having this incredible connected experience, but there was my body. There was, you know, that skin suit that I had been wearing around life, and it, and it was incredibly sad because um, my body was a wreck. I've taken for granted that I'm healthy and can run and be athletic and feel good, and, and yet there was my body so broken. A couple of things uh, were huge for me in that, and that is that I'm not my body. I, I was something far greater. And then also, I had peace, even in the trauma of everything that had happened by being out of the situation. And I also realized, too, that passing, I mean, dying, was very natural. It was very beautiful. I, I, you know, many might say that I suffered a very violent, traumatic death, you know, in the car accident and all the injuries and everything that had happened, but I wasn't even aware of the injuries. But I also knew I've got to get back in. I've got to get back in that body and carry on. I've got to live for my son. And once again, there was no figuring it out. I, it, it was intention. I'm going back in and then, boom, I was back in the body. But when I went back into the body, the heaviness and the regret, the guilt, the pain, the trauma, all of that. 
So I was in the hospital for almost six months. I mean, I, and it was awful to be back in the body. I, I, was, I was ventilated. They had a big tube, you know, down my throat doing the breathing since my lungs had collapsed. Uh, my legs were obviously immobile. My, my right arm was immobile. And then they had tied down my left arm because I, I kept grabbing at all the, all the medical equipment. It was really intense. In fact, it was almost like I had one foot in this realm and one foot in that realm because I would, I would find myself leaving the body every now and then. I would feel like, gosh, I need a break. And, and there was times I felt like I was over in the corner watching it all, just taking a break from it all, knowing I've got to get back in the body again. And I would go in and out of the body. I also had, it was like continued communication with Tamara, my wife. I recall having a very intense conversation with her when I was out of the body again. And she was letting me know what she wanted done at the funeral services. And she wanted her sister-in-laws to have her fancy dresses. And she wanted her cousin and her niece to have those special rings and the jewelry. I mean, it was, it was almost trivial things, but, um, but she was communicating to me. Probably the most profound thing that happened was at the end of my hospital stay. I was out of ICU, and I was in ICU for months, and then I would go to surgical recovery. I kept, I had horrible infections, I, I had uh, pneumonia in my lungs, I kept throwing uh, pulmonary embolisms, they're blood clots that lodge in your lungs, so I was very sick for a very long time. But by this case, I was out of ICU, out of surgical recovery, I was actually in the rehabilitation unit of the hospital. I, in fact, it was only weeks before I was to come home. I finally was able to roll and sleep on my side. And I, I remember falling asleep. And I mean, the guilt, the grief, the pain, the trauma, everything that I'd been dealing with. And wh while I was sleeping, I felt that light come again. Just like at the scene of the accident, suddenly I felt this blanket of light. And although I was joyful to be sleeping, the grief and the guilt, I mean, I'd lost half my family. I had lost half my body. I, I was worried about my son and, and how was he going to deal with this? How was I going to deal with it? So there was a constant worry, but I was peaceful in my sleep. And this light came and embraced me and was comforting me, just like at the accident in those situations. And again, I felt a lift. And then the light seemed to dispense like, like a fog or a mist that goes away. The light was gone and I was in the most incredibly beautiful place. And, and it was so real. Once again, it was so sensory. I mean, that might seem odd that it felt physical, but I was running. I could feel the ground beneath my feet. I could feel the warmth and the energy from the ground beneath my feet. And I began to run and it felt as if I was running. I mean, I could feel, you know, the, the, the muscles in my calves and thighs and I was joyfully, joyfully running. It's odd what was coming to my mind is, wow, it's good to be home. I was home. I mean, people say heaven or the other side to me. I was home. It was so familiar. It was so welcoming. I was so joyful to be there. And, and, and when I say it felt like a physical experience, everything was super sensory. I could taste the colors. I could smell what I was seeing. And I was elated to be there. I got this message. It was like a knowledge, like a knowing that, that you're not here to stay. And I thought, oh, I just want to stay, you know, and, and um, about the time I got that message, there was this corridor off to my left, and, and I knew intuitively I'm, I'm to go down there. And I made my way down the corridor, and as I did, I could see something at the end of the corridor, and so I made my way to the end of the corridor. And when I got there, it was a crib, much like the one Griffin had been sleeping in because he was still just a baby. I raced to the crib, and I looked in the crib, and there, there was Griffin, there was my little boy. And he was sleeping as peacefully and as beautifully as when I had peeked in the rearview mirror on the ride home. And I swept him up 
in my arms. Now, I, I had worried and had pain over that because I knew he'd been thrown from the car and I didn't know what had happened, but I knew he had been killed. But there he was, perfect. And when I swept him up, I, and, and again, it was so physical what I could feel. I could feel the heat from his body and I thought, he's okay. And I could feel him breathing. I could feel his rib cage expanding. I, I could feel his breath on my neck and I thought, he's okay. He's just fine. And, and then I, I, um, I smelled his hair. You know, I smelled his hair and thought, it's my little boy. He's perfect. He's okay. And I, I, and I could feel him solid against me. And, 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 I, and I was even marveling then, if I'm out of the body, how does it feel so physical? But it did. I could feel and smell and taste and touch everything. And I began to weep just thinking, oh, he's okay, and I, and I was holding him, and I had, I had longed for that over those months. And as I was holding him, I felt an intense feeling behind me. It was a presence. It felt so cosmic, so, so big, so wise, so powerful, and I, I began to become fearful. In fact, it, my thoughts were, that's God. I am in the presence of God, and then I began to have those guilt feelings again. I was holding my little boy thinking he died because I crashed the car. He's here because I messed up and lost control. And, and I, I began to th think, I, well, my, my thought was, I hope I'm forgiven. I hope some way I can be forgiven for, I mean, did I take the life of my little boy? I mean, that was the guilt. It was very deep. And as I was weeping, holding him and feeling this presence come behind, and as I had that thought, Suddenly this presence came so close, and, and this felt physical too. I felt these loving arms wrap around and hold us. And the message just came as powerful as could be, there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in pure divine order. Everything is okay. And it was almost like there was just this download of truth and knowledge and love and peace and all those misconceptions I had about God, that I was being tested, that I was probably failing, that I was going to be judged, those were swept away in pure, unconditional love. There are not even words for the love that I felt. As I was wrapped in those arms, and it was almost like me and my little boy became part of that, like we became God. And suddenly I was seeing everything differently. In fact, I saw my life. You know, I, I saw my parents get divorced and the insecurities that created in me, and I saw the relationship with my brothers and the things that had happened, and I saw things that I thought, well, that was a mistake. I, that was a mistake. But in those loving arms, it was just flowing, there are no mistakes. Everything's in perfect order. And I saw things that, like, I, I knew they were wrong, but I did them anyway. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, don't, don't, you know, and, and there was so much love. All that was flowing through me is, look how much we love you. Look how much we honor your choices. Look how much we honor your life. And I was being told, or I was, I say told, it wasn't with words, it was just with this pure energy that everything was perfect. Even that my life was perfect. That everything happened for a reason, that I was learning in every instance, and that actually that I was perfect. And that, that was a, that would blow my mind. I thought, well, how could I be perfect? But there was also this oneness in that. If I was perfect, then everyone else was perfect too, and everything was in divine order. And I also felt as if I was divine. Like I say, it's almost like we became God. I felt like I'm a divine soul. I'm a divine being of light, having this crazy life experience that my soul might expand, and yet none of it is real. This is real, that's just the, the stage of a play or something I'm going through, it's an experience I'm having. And also I learned about choice again. I was told that I could be angry at God my whole life and think that he took my family away or that, you know, somehow life was not fair. And that was okay. There was no judgment whatsoever. I could do that. But the beautiful thing is I was given another choice, and it was that I could exercise my will. I could give Griffin, I could give my son back to God, back to the universe, 
And then my will would be part of it, that I could make a choice in that, and I could literally let go in all that love and in all that peace and in all that beauty. I was able to kiss my little boy and give him back. And then I woke up back in the hospital bed, back to the amputation, the injuries, you know, all that had happened. But I had a little bit different perspective realizing everything's a choice and realizing that everything is in divine order. And that if I'm perfect, then everyone's perfect. There's no need to judge anyone for anything. And that life's actually perfect. If I could literally reach out and embrace it that way. The near-death experience can be life-transforming experience occurring under extreme physical conditions in which no sensory experience should be possible. It is a profound personal experience associated with death. And this is what our first episode is about. It is in two parts. Please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel.